hello everyone and welcome to the fourth and final episode of the Learn by Doing at Home series where we bring the CAFE's classroom to your home. My name is Allison Delacruz and I work in the Dean's Office for the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences. Uh, in today's class, uh, professors from our food science and nutrition department will be teaching us how to make some delicious Indian street food. Now, before we get started, I'm just going to go over uh, a few housekeeping items. So I'm going to hop over to um, a PowerPoint real quick so we can show you some tips on how to use Zoom. Um, now, the best way to view today's class is by clicking speaker view instead of gallery view. And you can find that in the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen. Also, if you have any questions during today's class, please put them in the chat and you can find the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you click that chat button, a separate window will pop up where you can enter your question. Um, note that in today's class, we will be saving all of our questions till the end and be doing, we will do a Q&A at the very end. Uh, with that said, please feel free to put your questions in the chat throughout the class. Um, we will uh, scroll back through at the very end and try our best to answer all of the questions. Um, we would also love to see photos of you learn by doing at home. Um, so please snap a photo and be sure to tag us um, on Instagram and on Facebook and to use the hashtag learn by doing at home. We will put um, the hashtag and our, um, our Instagram and Facebook tags in the chat for you. And lastly, before I kick things over to our instructors, uh, we'd like to know a little bit about who is joining us today and how you are affiliated to Cal Poly. So if you could answer the following que uh, poll question for us, that would be great. Okay, thank you so much for participating. We will give it a few seconds while we get all the responses. Awesome, well, it looks like the majority of people today, um, about 50% are Cal Poly alumni. Thank you so much for joining us. We also have uh, some Cal Poly parents, um, some friends, a few students and employees as well. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, we also have three Cal Poly donors. Thank you so much for generously supporting Cal Poly. And with that, we'll end the poll. And uh, without further ado, we'll kick things over to our instructors to get the class started. All right, welcome. Um, Glad you could join us today for our last, and I can arguably say our best learn by doing at home episode for Indian street food. So today we're going to learn about Indian food. Today we're going to learn about Indian food. Uh, I've got my partner in crime, Amy Lammer. We both teach in the food science and nutrition department. Um, I teach mainly the culinary science classes here. So this is the lab I teach in most of the time. Amy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I am Amy Lammer. I teach in food science and nutrition. I teach sensory evaluation of food. So how you evaluate how food tastes and I teach uh, product development, I can teach it with Dr. Amin. All right, so let's see um, some slides. Okay. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about Indian food. And actually, this is probably one of my favorite quotes. Um, I always love Anthony Bourdain, and if you've seen his sub shows, you know that he's kind of a carnivore. And this quote of his about vegetarian food and about Indian food in general and how they treat vegetarian food and vegetables is great because it shows the way they like to treat their ingredients. It's looking at the, the oven. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so looks <laughs> like we had a little bit of a technical difficulty there. So, um, 
what he does, he likes, he loves Indian food. He loves how they treat it. They use spices. Uh, they treat the vegetables very differently. And he can eat vegetarian food that way for his whole life. So when we look at India as a whole, it's a fairly large country. It's part of the Asian continent. And it's actually quite different than the rest of the Asian continent. Even though it shares geographic borders with many of the countries in Asia, it's actually separate. It's separated by the Himalayas and that gives it a very diverse cultural background <coughs> and a food diversity. Um, one, thing we no one thing we notice, Next slide. next slide, please. So, next slide. So, one thing we notice in Indian cuisine is we don't see a lot of noodles. When we look at most Asian cuisine, we tend to see a lot of noodles. In Indian cuisine, we see a lot more pulses and legumes, things like dal and things like that. So, we see a lot more of that in place of noodles. Um, this is one of the main differences that we see. Next slide. Next slide. States and Union territories. So, India is a vast country and it's made up of a number of different states. And as you can see from this map here, these different states are basically prior to its independence and partly British colonialism, were almost independent countries. <coughs> they developed their own cuisines. So you could travel through India and basically eat a different cuisine in each state. So there's a large variety of Indian food and it differs greatly from east to west and north to south. And we see main differences between North and South. Next, Next slide. slide. So what we tend to see mainly in the North is we tend to see foods that have <coughs> more dairy influences. We tend to see them use more um, tomato. They're going to use more <coughs> wheat in their foods. Um, their foods are tending to be a little bit milder. That's because we see a, a larger influence from Persia, uh, from the Mughal Empire coming in. When we look at southern India, we're going to see that their foods are going to be a little bit spicier. They're going to use a lot more tropical fruit. The climate in southern India tends to be hotter, more humid. It's a tropical environment. They're going to use more rice-based dishes. Um, coconut is going to replace that dairy. Their, their food is, as I said, it's going to be much spicier. And that goes with that hotter climate as well. We're not going to see the influence from Persia and the Mughal Empire as much because they didn't make it that far south. Next slide. So, the one thing about Indian cuisine is they use a lot of different spices, but some things they tend to use a lot. They'll use um, lemon, they'll use citrus in there to help temper the uh, spices and add a citrus note. And that helps to bring out the flavors. Next slide. The other thing, as you can see from all these spices, when we cook in Indian cuisine, we don't just add the spices in raw. We're gonna cook them in there to bring out more of their flavors. And you're gonna notice in one of our first dishes, when I make the chutney, we're gonna actually take some of these spices and fry them beforehand to release their aroma and their flavor into the oil to help spice their dishes. Next slide. Menu. And now I'm gonna go over the menu. What we're gonna make is we're gonna make two of the main types of street food dishes you find in India. And the difference between street food and the types of food you would find in India in a restaurant, or restaurant Indian food most people are probably accustomed to here in the US is 
these are the types of foods that you find on the side of the street. They're not meant as a meal. These are a quick little snack. And the beauty of street food is they really stretch across all walks of life. So whether you're rich or poor, you all go out and you all enjoy street food. So it doesn't matter and everyone's gonna go out and they're gonna have their favorite little place to get their street food. So we've got two of the main dishes or probably the most popular street food dishes in India. We're gonna do a Parni Puri and a dosa. So the first one I'm gonna do is the Raba dosa, which is a Indian version of a crepe. Um, we use semolina flour and rice flour in this one. And we're gonna serve it with sambar, which is a um, thin broth with lentils, vegetables, and tamarind. And then I serve it with a coconut chutney that is just to die for. And then the next one is Barney Puri. And it's probably the one Indian street food dish that is ubiquitous. If you were to ask any Indian what's the quintessential street food item, they'll say Barney Puri. Originally it's from Southern India, just like dosa, but you can find it all over India now. It's a little fried crisp, stuffed with potatoes, um, garbanzo bean, some spices, and filled with a spicy tamarind water. And it's the perfect thing to refresh you on a hot day. So let's get cooking. So okay. first thing, I'm going to do the dosa batter. So we've made this previously, and as I said before, it's um, rice flour, semolina flour and wheat flour, along with some cilantro, onion, and jalapeno. And we added in um, yogurt, because traditionally what you would do is you would let this mixture sit overnight and let it ferment. So it's a fermented product. Um, that's one of the other things about South Indian cuisine, they tend to do a lot of fermented products. So instead of letting it sit out overnight, you add in the yogurt and you let it sit for about an hour. And this, this recipe actually comes from a friend's cookbook, um, Maya Kamel's um, cookbook, and it's a really great recipe. So I'll make a couple of these. And while I'm making these, Amy can talk to you a little bit about some of these ingredients. Okay, everyone. So one of the interesting spices that is put in the whole acid or whole rabidosa mixture is a spice called asafoetida. And asafoetida is a dried latex exuded from the rhizome or taproot of several species of perula or perennial herbs that are growing to one to one and a half meters tall or 3.3 to 4.9 feet tall, shorter than you. They are part of the celery family. This ingredient has a strong smell. It's very similar to garlic and it's used in a wide variety of Indian cooking and Indian vegetarian food for its flavor and aroma. Although it's universally used in India, it is frequently used in the food of devout Jains and others who do not eat garlic and onion. Thanks, Amy. Where are we in this process right now, so, Dr. Amin? I'm heating up the pan with a little bit of oil. So you can also make this rabadosa with ghee. I personally don't use ghee that much. It's just a personal preference. I just don't like it. But one of the other dishes that we serve with the dough, so while this pan is heating up, so we need to kind of get it a little warm, is we do the sambar. So sambar is that um, broth I was telling you about with the vegetables, and it has, we've got green beans, we've got tomatoes, we've got fenugreek in here, we've got tamarind curry leaves, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna thicken it up with dal, 
tuber doll, which is a split pigeon pea that we've cooked with turmeric. So while this pan is heating up, I'm going to mix this in to here and let this cook to thicken. Would you like me to talk a little bit about the doll? That would be great if you could talk about it. Excellent. Okay, the poor doll is a split pigeon seed. It's split pigeon pea with a subtle nutty flavor. It is one of the yellow dolls. Poor doll is an ancient crop. It's believed to be cultivated for food in the last 3,000 years. Tor doll looks similar to China doll and can be substituted with or for China doll. In Indian grocery stores, you can get Tor doll with an oil coating to increase its shelf life or one without the oil. Amy, can you talk a little bit about the spice seasoning that goes in the sambar? Sure. In sambar, in addition to the doll, you have ground turmeric, you have a tamarind concentrate, you have fenugreek seed, the asafoetida that we just talked about, black mustard seeds, curry leaves, onions, as well as the sambar masala. Now, the sambar masala is an interesting blend of spices. In the sambar masala, you have more ground coriander, you have cumin, you have cashmere red chili, with a little bit of black pepper, turmeric, and a little more asafoetida. So when you smell the sambar masala, the first thing that I get is the cumin. But one of the interesting spices that I have found in the sambar masala is this little spice called cashmere red chili. And in the cashmere red chili, it is heat level similar to that of a poblano. It's vibrant, vibrant red in color. It has a fruity scent and a flavor. It has a fruity habanero-ish type scent. The color is absolutely beautiful. Of all the spices that we have used or Dr. Amin is using in this preparation, I have to say that the Kashmiri red chili is one of my favorites. Can you talk a little bit about how you uh, taste chilies? Sure, how you taste chilies. So when you put the spice on your tongue, okay, let me, I'm actually testing the somewhere. Mm. So good. Okay, so when you're tasting the sambar, or when you're tasting the chilies, you're going to get the initial taste on your tongue. So the taste that you'll get on your tongue are sweet, salt, sour, bitter, and umami, that kind of um, meaty, fullness taste. When you talk about flavor, flavor is what enters your nose either through smelling, and that's called orthonasal olfaction. Or as you put something as a, a food or a product in your mouth and you taste it, as the body warms up, you get something called retronasal olfaction. And retronasal olfaction is all of those volatile compounds that are being released due to the warm body heat of your body. They're becoming volatile and they're going up through the back of your nose and hitting your olfactory bulb. When we're specifically looking at the Kashmiri red chili, it has a Scoville unit or a Scoville heat unit of about 1,000 to 2,000 SHUs. So it's almost the equivalent heat of a jalapeno pepper, or it's about one eighth of the heat, depending on the age of the spice. And the origin of this chili is in India. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Amin, can you tell us a little bit about how you put the batter in the pan? Sure. So I've got a really, it's about a quarter of a cup of batter. And if you notice, it's really thin. It's almost water. So I pour it into the center and then just twirl the pan around so that I get it an even thickness. Basically, if you've ever made crepes, that's what you do. And then I put just a little drizzle of oil on the outside to help you. And how browned do you want these to be? Just want to get the outside a little golden brown. 
so we can see. And I'll tell you the, the first one always comes out a little dark. It's just getting the pan to the right temperature and heating up. Um, but after that, they start to go fairly quickly. So, Dr. Lamer, can you tell us a little bit more about the science of tasting? Sure. Well, we hit a little bit about the how you perceive taste on the tongue, and you need your nose to obtain flavor. So many times when you're sick, you'll say, you know, I don't taste my food. Well, the reason you don't taste your food is if your olfactory bulb is black with all that fun stuff that's happening with your sinuses. So you don't get those positive volatile compounds that are going and interacting with that olfactory bulb. Um, let's see, what more can we talk about? There are different four different types of taste papillae on the tongue. Taste papillae have a certain number of taste buds. There are actually taste papillae that are on your tongue for the sole purpose of ripping the food. The traction, it pulls the food in place on your tongue while you're chewing it. Different taste papillae have different amounts of taste buds. Thank you, Dr. Lammer. I believe they're learning that in Food Science and Nutrition 319 right now. Yes, they are actually learning that in the GE course. So Dr. Amin, other than the sambar so, and the dosa, what are the other components of this dish? So we've got a coconut chutney. Let me just get this one out. I will turn the pan down a little bit, because I'll make a couple more in a minute. So with coconut chutney, what we have here is I've taken dried unsweetened coconut, mixed it with ginger, um, some spices, ginger spices uh, and yogurt. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to take some um, curry leaves, which I've got in here, and these curry leaves I bought a while ago, so we keep them frozen so they don't go bad. And black mustard seed and some chili peppers, dried red chili pepper, we're gonna heat up the oil and we're gonna fry them. It's gonna release all that aroma and flavor into the oil, then we'll add our um, ground coconut in that and cook it for about 30 seconds. And it'll really make a beautiful tasting chutney that you serve with it. These are two traditional side dishes that you would serve with. Dr. Dr. Lambert, is there a reason why you would put the spices in the oil first? Um, yes, the reason goes back to a little bit of chemistry. A lot of your compounds are oil soluble. In order, and in order to taste those volatile flavors and aromas that we enjoy. Sometimes you need to put them in oil to be able to release the complete richness of that spice in order to taste it. Thank you. Dr. Amin, can you tell us a little bit more about the role of chutneys in Indian cuisine? So chutneys are usually used uh, as a, an accompaniment for food. There's a number of different types of chutneys. Chutneys can be sweet, they can be sour, um, they can be spicy. And, you know, here in the U.S., when we think of chutney, we think of it having to be something that's fruit-based, but it doesn't necessarily have to be fruit-based in India. It can be a vegetable-based chutney. Um, and a lot of times, uh, chutney and pickle are used interchangeably in India, and it'll have a tart component and a spicy component to it to help bring out flavors within the food. Dr. Lamer, I remember when we were prepping for this, you did not particularly enjoy the flavor of the mustard seed, which is featured in this chutney. Can you talk a little bit more about the flavors of oh, that spice? Goodness. <laughs> that black mustard was a little less than positive for me. So it was very pungent and it was very 
very, very sharp mustard. Personally, I wasn't a fan. However, in India, when you cooked food, sometimes spices were used for medicinal properties. And in this case, the black mustard was used to promote good respiratory health. It stimulated appetite, as well as had some potential diuretic purposes. But in this coconut chutney, I think it's important to mention, while Dr. Reed's doing a little bit of cookie, there's coconut, onion, yellow onion, mints, ginger, jalapeno, plain yogurt, lemon juice. So we're starting to get some of the tartness that he was talking about, about the flavor development. There's kosher salt. There's that, my favorite, that black mustard seed. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But also, there's some red chili peppers, the curry leaves that he showed you, and a little bit of canola. Oh, there's red hot chili peppers in here. Huh. <laughs> I'll, I'll spare you the bad jokes with the red hot chili peppers. We'll give that one away now. <laughs> so, Dr. Amin, when you add these so, spices to the oil, how long are you looking to cook them for? Not long at all. Maybe you just want the mustard seeds to start to pop. So what you're looking for is the oil to start to shimmer. And what I like to do is when I start to see that oil start to shimmer, I'll either turn the heat off on the pan or take the pan off of the heat. And I'll start to heat and sputter. And then if I need to, I can always put it back over the heat. Because these will burn very quickly. As you see, it's starting to sputter. And all over the place, right about now, my wife will be hitting me over the head. Thing. She doesn't want to clean up that. Now, for those who are the chemists amongst us, the mustard seed has a lot of oleic acid. You might have remembered that if you were a student in our alcoholism chemistry class, you were a few in students, you looked at the uh, nutritional value of some of the oleic acids in your diet. All right. And I should mention that a lot of South Indian recipes do use the black mustard seed in their cooking. The black mustard seed, I don't know if um, Aaron has showed you, but it looks like a fat poppy seed, more of a round, bigger poppy seed. That's what it looks like to me. All right. So, Dr. Amin, are we almost ready to plate? Almost. Just to know, to know, I'm watching the chat, and one of our friends in the audience said they like our lighthearted jokes, and that um, was incredible. We need a little bit of levity today. <laughs> And so I'm glad you like our jokes because as Dr. Amin and I teach classes, this is typically kind yes. of our interaction. So if we're into jokes, should I talk about Batman and Robin? Sure. Okay, so when Dr. Amin and I teach classes, I am Batman and he is Robin, but since he knows a little bit more about Indian street food than myself, I am handing over the keys to the Batmobile to him today. For him to be Batman, and I'm happy to be Today, Batman. I get to be Batman. That's my bad imitation of Batman. But so usually I do the dad jokes. Oh, he's got really good dad jokes. Can you uh, share any that you remember? Oh, the one about fun facts. Oh, I've been told I tell that one way too often. But the fun guy jokes are really good. Yeah. But it doesn't work with this. I need a mushroom. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I don't have any coconut jokes. Yeah. So I don't have any material to feed to you. <laughs> so Amy, while Samir's uh, working on this and getting ready to plate you something delicious to eat, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what the sensory testing setup is going to look like in our new building? Oh my gosh, I so cannot wait to get a new sensory testing setup. We are going to have 
24 individual booths where we can actually conduct sensory testing. A lot of times, for those of you who don't know what sensory testing is, it has to do about the taste of the foods. And when companies develop a product, at the end of the day, it's the consumer that gives you the thumbs up or the thumbs down on the product. And one of the ways that companies gauge the quality or the liking or the potential success of a product is evaluating the sensory attributes. And in our new facility, we will be getting a state-of-the-art 24-seat sensory lab. Oh my gosh, I am so excited about that potential. Additionally, next to that sensory space will be a state-of-the-art culinary lab designed by none other than your doctor, our own doctor and me, with influence from the CIA. And that has nothing to do with... Not the one in Langley. Thank you. I couldn't think of that city. It has to do with the Culinary Institute of America. So one of the things now that companies are doing is getting a lot more consumer involvement at the initial stages of product development. And so consumers are brought in early in the process as opposed to the end of the process. And one of the advantages of having a state-of-the-art culinary lab next to a sensory lab is that we will be able to deliver our students some amazing, amazing experiences that they won't be able to get at other locations. And it looks like Dr. Lee has some food for me too. I'm getting really hungry over here. Just looking because as Dr. Lee knows, one of my favorite foods is coconut. Actually, that's not true. Coconut is not one of my favorite foods. But because it's Dr. Lee, I will have the coconut chutney with the rabbinosa which looks really super fantastic. And I'm sure everyone is just waiting to watch me eat. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Amin, how am I supposed to eat this? So what you do is you actually put a little bit of the sambar onto the dosa and some of the chutney onto the dosa, and okay. you eat. So how does this look? Okay, so the summer oh, yeah. Actually, what you should do is you should try each component separately. Okay, each component separately. So we have. Didn't they teach you anything when you went to college? No. Louder, louder snark. No. Okay, so. Come on. This I, I know Papa Partridge taught you better than that in Michigan State. I know State. Papa Partridge taught you better than in Michigan State. Okay, so we have a sunbar. Oh my gosh, this looks so good. Can you describe what it looks like, Amy? Okay. I'm a Midwesterner, if you can't tell by my accent. To me, the sambar looks a little bit like what I would call a vegetable soup. You see the chunks of tomato, you see the green beans, you see the onions, and then you see the dog. And it's got this really pretty orangish color with a little small fleck of the spices. Oh, that's really good. Okay, I'll stop there. Now, to make Dr. Mean happy, I will have his coconut chutney on its own. No, that isn't too bad. One of these days you'll actually trust me when I tell you about food. <laughs> I know, I know, but that's actually really pretty good. Can you tell us a little bit more about the flavor? Because I think people think okay. coconut when they hear coconut. Okay, when I eat coconut, I think that bad awful texture that's in Almond Joy in the strips of coconut, this actually is a really pleasant, soft, creamy coconut flavor. It's not overpowering and the texture is real positive. So now, let me go ahead and test this. Oh, this looks so good. Now the key is going to be for me not to make a mess of myself when I eat this. That can be interesting. Okay. So Dr. Janine, did I make it look pretty and appropriate? Yes. Okay. Mm, okay. That's really good. Like seriously, that's really good. Oh my, is that really good? Um, yeah, Indians know. Yeah. Just the whole subcontinent knows it's good. Yeah. We know food. Oh. Oh, this is so, you know what? It's interesting because 
the um you want to eat well and you want to have a good time go to an indian wedding mm. all right dr lambert i'm gonna let you work on that a little okay. off screen and uh just finishing up one more dose up and then I'm sure someone's gonna want one and then can you tell us a little bit about the next recipe so next we're gonna probably do one of my favorites the party puri. so turn this down um and we're going to actually it's a really s simple dish um as you saw most of these they're fairly quick to make. They take a little bit of time ahead for prep, but they're, they're quick to do, and that's part of the reason why they're street food. It's something that can be made very quick and easy, you know, on the side of the road. And I guess when people think of street food, they think of, you know, the push carts that you would see in New York City, doing the hot dogs or the pretzels. But in the grander scheme of things, especially when you look at Asia and other cultures that have more developed street food. Street food also means those little tea houses where you can go sit down and have a small little meal. It's more of that type of food, more of snack food, I guess you could say. Um, something that you would have in between lunch and dinner to hold you over. Okay, just to give you a little bit of comment on the group chat. We have some of our friends in the audience indicating that they wish they would have thought about ordering Indian food takeout so that they could cook or eat along with Dr. Amin. There, we have several starving people yes. in the audience. We would love to feed you, by the yeah. way. This is really good, okay? And then we have a fantastic compliment on how it looks. Fantastic. And how this is torture watching how good this food is. Yep. So for our party puri, what we started with, we had our, where did I put one? Here. Okay. Sorry. We've got our ingredients here. These little shells are what puff up into these. You can either deep fry them or you can put them in the microwave. Um, in the microwave, they take 15 to 30 seconds. And that's all it takes to get them like this. I, I kind of like the texture deep fried. They're a little bit chewier microwave, but it's, it's a lot quicker and easier. So, when you fry them after they're done or microwave them, you poke holes into them. And then we actually create a filling. We have a question from yeah. a gentleman by the name of Michael Chang. I think you might know him. Can you air fry those? Michael, just deep fry. Uh, <laughs> yes, you, you, could, you, could, you could air fry them. You could. And then what are you showing us now, Dr. Amin? This is actually the filling for the party puri. So this is boiled potato, diced, red onion diced, um, some garbanzo beans, slightly mashed. Um, these are the larger garbanzo beans. So if you wanted to know, um, these would actually be the Kabuli garbanzo beans. The little ones that you find in the Indian grocery store, those are desi garbanzo beans. Um, that's just a different variety. I know way too much about garbanzo beans from my previous life doing product development. Um, then we've got in here, what makes this really outstanding is the chaat masala. That's a spice blend. And I will have Amy tell you about what's in the chaat masala. All right, Dr. Lammert. Okay, in the chaat masala, we have ground cumin a dried mango powder called anchor, and anchor is from dried green mangoes, mangoes, sorry. It has a sour, mildly acidic, mildly fruit flavor. It's actually really good when you try it on its, on its own. We have a little bit of dried ginger. We have some mint. We also have something called ajwan seeds, 
and it um, has a unique pungent bite. It's a little bit of the scent is sweet thyme and coriander, but to me it reminds me almost of a fennel seed, and it's really good. Um, the ajwan has medicinal properties as well, as well as the amchor. But moving on, in the shot masala, we have salt. We have black salt. Now, black salt is actually something that I found very, very interesting. It's, the black salt is a pinkish color, but it has a very sulfur mineral scent. It gives a, a, a significant tang additions. It's not a substitute for salt. But for individuals who are vegan, and when you're doing a vegan egg replacement, it has a very sulfur taste to it. So a lot of times, black salt is used in vegan egg products. I actually liked the black salt. I thought it tasted fantastic. We have a hint of citric acid, a little bit of our cashmere red chili pepper, which was my favorite bright red, mildly spicy heat, as well as the acetatina. And all of that mixed together is some, it's a nice spice blend. And you can make it, and how long will you make it ahead of time? Uh, so oh, how long can, you can keep it? You can keep it for probably about um, airtight. I would probably say keep it maybe about a month. Now, when you say airtight, would you keep it in a glass jar? Would you keep it in a bottle? or I, in a I would keep it in either glass or metal. Not a plastic bag. I wouldn't want to do plastic. Um, flavors will start to leach into the plastic. Get some flavor scalping. So um, the other component is the spicy tamarind water. So in here we have um, tamarind, we've got ginger, um, we have... Tell us, Dr. Lammer, what else is us, in the tamarind else? water? Oh my goodness, in that tamarind water, Oh my gosh, we have ginger, we have jalapeno, we have mint, we have cilantro, there is more cumin, more black salt, more of our favorite asafoetida. I think I just like saying that term. I like, and I also have the, we also have the ground black pepper, salt, sugar, a little bit of lime juice, and the seedless tamarind puree, and you mix it up with a little bit of ice water. How much is a little bit of ice water? Dr. Amin, would four you like half. to talk about that? So it's about four and a half cups of ice water. So we're, what, what are we going to do with this tamarind water once it's pureed? So what we do after all of this is pureed, we fill our shells with the filling, and then we pour our pureed tamarind water into it, and then you pop it right in your mouth. And it's just a great flavor explosion. So I'm going to puree this up right now. Okay, wow, that's beautiful. Oh, that is such a pretty green color. And I bet it smells even better. Oh my gosh. Okay, would it be inappropriate to drink right from this piece? Well, um, Dr. Amin, can you tell us about the other uh, tasty application of tamarind water? Oh, well, actually, we found this out um, in the fall that 
extra tamarind water mixes really well with gin and tonic. It makes a delicious little um, aperitif. What did we name it? Actually, I, I, what did we settle on the name? The Viceroy. The Viceroy, yes. We decided to call it the Viceroy. Oh my goodness. Okay, I could sit here and eat this with a spoon. And that is not a joke. This is really, really good. I bet that aperitif Viceroy would be really fantastic. I so, can't wait to see see what's next. <laughs> the other thing you could do with these, since, I mean, I've got um, potato in here, I've got garbanzo bean. If you didn't want to do potato, you could easily change this out and you could put in, um, what is it, avocado, you could use a different bean, you could pretty much make the filling almost anything you wanted to. That's the one of the nice things about any of the zine, that it does lend itself nicely to experimentation. So in terms of popularity of Indian street food, where would you rank this Pani Puri? This is probably the most popular dish of Indian street food. This is probably the most popular Indian street food dish. Why would you say it's the most popular Indian street food dish? It's from flavor profile, it appeals to everybody. Um, if you think about the climate in India, it is hot. It is really hot. Um, I still remember one of the times I went there. I must have been about 13. It was July. We landed in Mumbai. They told us it was 98 degrees with 99% humidity and it wasn't raining. So, it's a really hot, humid country, especially during monsoon season. And as hopefully Amy will attest to in a moment, she'll see that this is a very light and refreshing street food dish. I am getting super excited in case anybody is concerned about that. Um, the only problem with this dish, if you do go to India and you try it, very, very careful about actually having it on the street. Why would that be, Dr. Because it's made with water. Okay. And that could wreak havoc with you intestinally. Oh my goodness. And this is all for me? So I'm going to have to. Do I have to share? Well, you're going to have to pour your own in. Okay, I can do that. You want to make sure you stir this up. Okay. Um, different ways, different people have different ways of doing it. Sometimes they'll put out a large bowl and you can actually dip it in there and fill it up. But I don't think in this day and time that would be quite appropriate to do. Hold on, okay. So, and I thought it would be better to watch her to try it. I feel like you've given her a dangerous oh, task. I'm just going to see now that's pressure. Yes. Thank you. So make sure you kind of fill it up pretty full. Oh, is that enough? No, 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 no. You want to make sure you get it all in there. Okay, but is it going to fall overboard? Is that okay? No. Oh. Is that good or did I not turn up? Can I see? I want to eat this so I don't want to eat it. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I don't know what I like better. I don't know if I like the crunch of this whole disc. I don't know if I like more of what the potato and chickpea mixture is with the onions on the inside. Oh my gosh, it's happening. But topping it off with this tamarind water is absolutely simple. It is so good. It is so fresh. I can see where in hot, muggy, stifling climates, why people would choose to eat this. This is really good. I think the first thing you get is you get the textural crunch, but then you get the strong, strong pop of the flavors from the tamarind water. Right. Oh my gosh. You get so many different textures in there. Mm. You get the crunch, you, you get the mm. crunch, you get the softness of the potato, mm -hmm. you've got so many different flavor compounds, components. Oh my goodness. 
Yes. Sure, Dr. Lambert, will you hand the book to uh, Dr. Amin so we can talk a little bit, a little bit about where these uh, recipes so, came from? The recipes for um, the rava dosa, the sambar, and the coconut chutney actually came from this book, Curry, Curry Favors. Um, it's from Mike Mel. She's a cookbook author and uh, she's also a friend. So and she's recipe, at mine right now. Yeah, she, and her recipes were great. Um, when I needed to find a good recipe for a dosa, I knew her recipe would taste authentic and it would work because every other time I used to make dosa, it never would come out. Hers always did. So thank you, Mom. Um, and actually, all of her recipes were really good. She says, thank you for the plug. Um, Dean's office, can you give us a sense of a couple more questions we might have gotten during the chat? Um, I, we got go a ahead. couple of questions about where are the best place is to buy some of these ingredients. So it depends on where you are. Um, I tend to I live here in the Central Coast. I tend to drive to Southern California. I go to Cerritos because I used to live in Southern California, so I know the stores down there. Um, you can go to San Jose, but if you don't feel like driving, Amazon. Amazon pretty much has all of these spices and all of these ingredients online. You can even buy fresh curry leaves from Amazon. Uh, if you're by any major metropolitan area, any major metropolitan city, you will find an Indian grocery store or even a good Middle Eastern grocery store should carry all of these spices. And then Dr. Amin, I think one of the only uh, spices we haven't spoken about too much this evening is turmeric. Turmeric, yes. Um, yeah, I didn't put that down because I thought that was kind of one that's pretty well-known. Um, most people are kind of familiar with it. It's not one that I thought was too unique. Because um, I also didn't put, we didn't talk about cumin or coriander. All right. Any other spices that we use that you think folks would be less familiar with that you would like to highlight? I don't know. Uh, Amy? Oh my goodness. How about you? Was there any that no, but I think we have some interesting questions in the chat. We have a question from our friend Eileen, and she wants to know how do these, and I'm assuming the penny curry, different from, differ from samosas? So a samosa is a hot, hot um, product. The pani puri are cold and crispy. The samosa, it's more of a rolled out dough. Um, the fillings can be very similar, and samosa are meant to be eaten warm, while party puri are meant to be eaten cold. Um, I hope that answered it. And then we had another question or a comment in there um, from our friend Ming Mali. And it was mentioned earlier that the spices are cooked in advance. Can you speak to more of the science of that? Um, yeah, so what that does is cooking the spices helps to release a lot of the flavors, but it also helps to mellow them out. Uh, if you ever put like straight curry powder into a dish or even something like chili powder into a dish and tried it right away, you would notice that it's harsh, it's very bitter. And as it cooks longer, those flavors tend to mellow out. And that's part of the reason why in Indian cuisine, we tend to cook our spices up front. We tend to help to release a lot of the flavors, but we also, it mellows out that harshness we find in a lot of the um, spices. We've had several comments on the Viceroy beverage. So I just wanted you to know that that was a, a strong hit. Yeah. Oh, that would be very, very good. Okay. The other, we did have another question. Um, let me see. And this will probably be the last one. Um, 
Number one, I did put the information about the cookbook in the chat, so you should be able to go back and find that. And then the other question was from our friend Mary. She's wondering if we can grow a curry plant here. Yes, you can, you can grow curry trees here. How can you do that? Um, actually, usually you can buy a cutting and, or get a cutting from someone and just grow it that way. It's a tree. Um, I've seen people selling the cuttings. Um, I've actually got to go pick one up, pick up a tree up by woodland. That's probably about six feet tall by now. Um, but yeah, you can, you can grow them. I know a few people who have them growing. It's just a matter of being able to get the cutting to start it. Excellent. Okay. I think um, we did have a, quite, a comment from our friend Wyatt, and he said, Penzi Spices has excellent spices and quality. So okay. that was the source of the spices. We had our friend and our um, rock star department head talk about the San Luis Oriental Market on Monterey Street in San Luis. It's a great place to grab some ingredients. Some are available at Vaughn's and Whole Foods right. and the rest of Amazon. And we did have, oh, <laughs> and we have a couple of my students are, are saying hi. Hi guys, I miss hi. you all. We do miss you. Yes. Thank you, Samir and Amy. We are coming up to the end of our time here. This was a, a super fun class. Um, just a couple of closing remarks as we finish up here. Uh, soon, Samir and Amy will be moving to the new Boswell Ag, Ag Tech Center, as Amy talked about, uh, where we will have state-of-the-art culinary, sensory, food safety, and nutrition labs that will help Cal Poly realize its food forward vision. Uh, to learn more about our new labs, uh, to see a uh, live stream of the construction site, and also learn how you or your company can get involved, you can see the link in the chat. Uh, please don't forget to post photos of you uh, cooking some delicious Indian street food and use hashtag learn by doing at home. If we weren't able to answer your question today, we put um, Samir and Amy's contact information in the chat so you can reach out to them. Um, and if you want to rewatch today's lesson or forward it to a friend, uh, we put that link in the chat for you as well. And that's about it. Thank you so much for joining us. This concludes the final episode of our Learn by Doing at Home series. Uh, we know several of you have joined for all four classes. Thank you so much for spending every Wednesday in the month of May with us. Uh, we hope that you found these classes to be fun and instructive. And we appreciate your continued support of the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environmental Sciences. So thank you so much and happy cooking.